Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show, where as custom, we have two objectives. First is to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And secondly, is to edify each other in the Lord. And the fact that you're here with us today, it means that we are on our way to accomplish both of these objectives. So we, we are grateful that you are here. Our topic this evening is wounded families and the importance of fathers wounded families on the importance of father our honored guest this evening is dr Salachek. dr Salachek is a professor at andrews university a man who loved god and it is such a great honor and a privilege um, to have him here with us this evening and so as the program progress, you will hear directly from Dr. Slotchek. But at this time, I'm going to call upon Pastor Bulgin. Pastor Bulgin, would you please um, give us opening prayer, please, so we could ask God to lead us in this um, discussion going forward. Pastor Bulgin. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you again for your love and your mercy. For your grace towards us, we thank you for this another Father's Day as we turn our hearts and our minds around to look at the fathers, not only in our local community, but around the world. We pray, dear God, that you would continue to bless these fathers, to strengthen them, to encourage them, to empower them as they seek to leave their home according to your divine will. We are thankful for this platform whereby we can come aside and we can glorify you and edify one another. We pray that the things that are being discussed this evening will be clear to our minds, that we will be drawn closer to you and be prepared for the day when our faith will be made sight and we shall dwell with you at last, because we ask it in the worthy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Bolgin. Up next uh, is Dr. Smart Clark. Dr. Smart Clark, please. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that brought my liberty I do not know just why he came to love me so he looked beyond my faults and saw my need. I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary. Jesus died 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, Doc. Indeed, we appreciate it. Uh, at this time, I want you to help me to welcome our honor guest this evening, Dr. David Silacek. He's married to his beautiful wife and partner in ministry, um, Beverly Silacek. They co founded a uh, ministry. They are also the author uh, of a book, and we will tell you more about that e e later on as the show develops. But at this time, I want you to help me to welcome our honor guest this evening, um, Dr. David Slachek. Welcome to this show, Dr. Slachek. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor and Mrs. Barnaby. We're so glad to be here with you tonight. I've been asked to talk about uh, wounded families and especially the role of fathers since this is Father's Day. And I want to go back way to the beginning of our human experience. Adam and Eve were in the garden. Their relationship was perfect. It was whole. There was no brokenness because they were created in the very image of God by God himself. And yet we know, sadly, that, that uh, they chose to follow the... Um, the prompting of the enemy who had insinuated doubt and and from that time on we take a look at some really dysfunctional dynamics in the human family uh, dynamics of blaming victimizing each other hiding shame and uh, and and since then families all of our families we have to admit have been broken and sometimes you know that's the hardest thing for us to admit that we are not perfect parents and until we come to the place where we see that we're probably going to continue this cycle of dysfunction the cycle of dysfunction and sin where hurt people most of the time unintentionally hurt other people and certainly our children in the process. One of the things that uh, the Bible talks about in the book of Deuteronomy is that the iniquity of the fathers is visited upon the children, even to the third and fourth generation. And we know from a study of, of neuroscience and genetics that there are many conditions that are passed along from parents to children. You know, for example, we can take a look at physical conditions like heart disease and diabetes. Addictions of all kinds are, are, are passed along, and, and there are genetic components to that. For example, children of a father who is an addict are uh, six, to, six to nine times more likely to become addicts than the children of of non-alcoholic fathers. And one of the reasons why is that their research has shown is that their livers metabolize alcohol differently. They have a, a high tolerance from the very first time they take their first drink. We also know that their brainwave patterns are very different than, than those of the children of non-alcoholics. We also have not just genetic inherited predispositions, but we also have, but we also have um, modeling that's a very big part of it. And, and so children tend to observe their parents. They tend to mimic their parents. And so if, if a child learns, for example, that daddy um, calms himself down by using alcohol or drugs of some kind, they'll learn, well, if daddy did it, maybe I can do it too. And, and so there are those, those inherited predispositions that are by nurture, not just by nature. And so it's really important that we, we take a good, honest look at ourselves. You know, every child has needs to be loved by his father. And, and by his mother. But fathers play a, a really unique role. For example, in my own life, 
my father never, when I was a child, never once used the words, David, I love you. It was only when my father was older, probably in his 50s, and, and I had gotten some healing on board myself, that I told him one day, you know, Dad, I really love you. And his response was, oh, well, I love you too. You know, love was something, at least verbally, that was assumed. And it was assumed, it was assumed because Dad was a good provider, you know, he, he took care of the bills, he provided, you know, food and clothing and shelter for us. And, and, and so, you know, it was meant to be, well, if he did those things, that's, act of, that's an act of love. And it's true. It's true that that was certainly an act of love. But one of the things that research shows is that we also need words of affirmation. You know, I love and I want to take us to a biblical example of that. At the, at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, his father said to him, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And, and what that did is it was a voice in Jesus' ears right be, even before he began his ministry. It was right at his, at his baptism where he was affirmed by his father. And he needed that because of the hard road that was going to be ahead of him. And you know, right after that, it's very interesting that, that Jesus was taken by the spirit into the wilderness. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And at the end of that time, he was tempted. And the temptations of the devil were very, very fascinating. They were attacks on, on Jesus' identity because the devil said, if you are the Son of God, then do something to prove it. Or turn these stones into bread, for example. To feed yourself because you're hungry. And, and again, we know that Jesus responded by using the word of God. You know, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But I would suggest to us that when children do not leave their families of origin with a good, solid sense of their identity, then they're going to be set up by the, attack, by the attacks of the enemy to doubt who they are. And when you doubt who you are, you're going to try to borrow your sense of identity from somebody else. You know, if, if my wife thinks I'm okay, then I'm okay. So I'm going to do whatever I have to to try to please her to prove that I'm a good guy. You know, that, that, I, that I'm worthy of, of her admiration or worthy of her love. But you know what? God wants us to leave our, our families with that question already settled. That I know that I am a child of God. I know I am dearly beloved. And who stands in God's place until a child gets to know God for himself? Who stands in that? Who stands in God's place? Well, I'd suggest to you that it's the father and the mother who stand in God's place to pour into that child the love of God, selfless love. I love you even if you misbehave. Even when you don't do what I ask you to do, my love is not conditional. That's covenant love. That's the kind of love that God had for us. Even while we were sinners, he sent his son in love to die for us. So that kind of love is the love that parents and especially fathers need to pour into their children. I love you. You are my beloved son. You know, when, unfortunately, what we see far too often is we see fathers telling their children, you know, um, you're dumb, you're stupid, you know, especially when education is very important to us in terms of our, our, our family values. You know, and a, a child brings home a B rather than straight A's. 
why didn't you get all A's? What happened to you conveying to that child that there's just something wrong with you, that you're a poor student, that you're a failure, that you displeased me? And, and so when we tell our children, you're dumb, you're stupid, you're lazy, or sometimes if a mother tells a child, well, you're just like your father, if he wasn't very reliable, or he was this or that, and I see you're just like him. You know, those messages diminish a child's sense of value and worth and, and their, their sense of whole identity. And, and that is really, really important in the life of a child. Another, another thing that is so important in the life of a child is that a father is there to spend time with that child, to give that child attention. And, and sometimes the reality is, is that we are so busy trying to earn a living for our children, trying to provide for our children, that we even miss our children. Now, my dad, whom I, I love dearly, dad died about four years ago at the age of 96, so he lived a good, long life. And, and my dad, I mean, he was reliable as the day is long. You know, he was, he was there, but he was not emotionally present. And one of the reasons why he wasn't emotionally present is he wasn't emotionally connected to himself. And, and so he couldn't connect with us emotionally. And, you know, you, we've heard the concept of emotional intelligence. And, and, you know, my dad, for all the wonderful wonderful qualities that he had, you know, wasn't emotionally intelligent or available. He didn't know to come and play with us, and, you know, to, to just be a part of our lives. You know, he was, he was busy doing good things, but not just being. And there's a, a very big difference of conveying a message of being, and I delight in you just because you are, not because of what you do. We don't want to teach our children that they have to perform in order to earn our love, to earn our acceptance. And, and so fathers play a very, very important role in them um, because I think it's important for us as adults to be vulnerable in the lives of our children, and especially us as fathers. Um, I... My, my, dear, my dear wife, Beverly, is my second wife. We've been married now for over 34 years, and, you know, it's, it's the best decision I ever made is to, uh, is to marry this beautiful, wonderful, wonderful woman. But I was married once before for 12 and a half years, and, and during that time, I admit that I was broken. Even though I was counseling other people, I hadn't looked at myself because in my family of origin, the message I received was that I had to be perfect. And if you have to be perfect and you're told you have to be perfect, then it's not okay for you to make any mistakes. And so I lived under the illusion, the false illusion, that I was perfect. And, and so I couldn't allow myself to admit that I made any mistakes at all. And so I was defensive when people would point mistakes out to me and all of that. And so I began this journey of healing for myself. And as a part of that journey of healing, I had to go to my children and honestly admit to them the mistakes that I had made in their lives when I was broken and not in a journey of healing at all. I had to go and humble myself and apologize to them. You know, and, and I had to admit to myself, I, I can remember the day when God invited me come, to come down off my pedestal of perfectionism and to join the human race, to let, me, to let myself be, be human, let myself make mistakes, and to admit that to myself and to my children, to the other people around me. And you know, it was a great day because I could be connected to myself, not just cognitively with my thinking, 
but I became connected with myself effectively with my feelings and my emotions. In other words, I was able to begin integrating my right brain and my left brain together and functioning as a whole person, not just as a cognitive person who had no connection with his own emotions and feelings. And it was from that day that I came down off that pedestal of perfection, that I could begin relating to people, especially my children, from my heart, connecting with them, feeling them, and listening carefully to them and being empathic with my children. And so those are some thoughts that I want to share about the role of fathers in the lives of their children. So, so very, very important. And, and you know, sometimes we have fathers. You know, I truly appreciate that. And, and again, it's, it's a great privilege and honor to have you here. This is a time where we enter into a dialogue and I'm very excited about it. And also the audience will join in as well. I will start ask a question, a few questions. My wife, the co-host, will ask a few questions, and then the audience will 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 get involved as well. Um, our topic uh, again is wounded family and importance of father. And based on what you just share with us, given that we deal with Father's Day, would you? conclude as a therapist that father is very important in the family structure. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, when, when we take a look at um, when, it, when a child is first born, the mother plays a very important role with nursing and we know that attachment gets formed between that mother's heart and that baby's heart and but the mother plays a very, very important role. But um, research shows that a father in the lives of his sons and even his daughters plays an extremely important role, not just as a provider, but as, as a representative of Father God. And, and so the picture that our children get of who God is comes from daddy, comes from daddy. And it, it is so critical. For that, for that child to know that God is there because daddy is there. Now, the Bible goes on to say in, for example, the book of, um, of, of Hebrews, that um, um, as a father disciplines his child, so God disciplines a child that he loves, which tells us that a, a, a father's discipline is important. But, what does the word discipline mean? It means to disciple or to teach, not to beat them up or punish them all the time, but to, to teach them and to teach them some very important things, you know, so that they will be successful in living life without me. To launch as a successful whole adult person, not, you know, not always dependent on the apron strings, you know, later in life, but been able to function successfully without me. So fathers play such an important role. Dr. Sadacek, what would you say to someone who has never had a father and those who have lost their father to violence or to police brutality? What message would you give to that child or to the mother? How can they cope? without a father. Yeah, that is a very, very painful and unfortunately all too often um, frequent reality. You know, I have, I have two black sons and three black grandsons. And, you know, my wife is African-American and, and, you know, my fatherly concern for my sons and grandsons is, is always there. But, but when, when a father's been lost, it's important, I think, for the community to rally around that family. Because I believe that it takes a village to raise a child. You know, a group of people who are able to stand in for, for dad, to model it, to spend time with, that, with that, those children. 
you know, to not just leave a, the single mom to raise those kids to be father and mother together. And especially in church congregations, you know, for, for other men in the church to mentor um, those children of that father who's no longer there for whatever reason. Uh, to come alongside them, to let them know that they care, to take them out, to do things with them, to be in, to become actively involved in their lives. You know, to me, that's what that's what churches can do. And again, one one of the roles is also to to lead that that child into a healthy knowledge of of God and what God's word says and how that can be a guide you know, a lamp unto that child's feet and a light unto his path, you know. So there are things that can be done, I guess is what I'm saying, even when, when the biological father is not there for others to step in and to take, and to take the place of father, even though I recognize that no one will ever be able to fully take the place of, or of the biological daddy. Thank you. Um, if, if I may, um, I, and then after this, if, if there's anyone in the audience want to engage in, in a question, I, I I'll let you do so. Um, Dr. Selechek, in, in respect to the issue that's going on in our community in respect to the civil unrest, and those, even though you have touched on it, but if you could elaborate, elaborate, uh, elaborate even further, in respect to those um, children have lost their um, their father and now are fatherless, and and I'm I'm sure I'm confident you can talk to this because you are a man that not just a white man but also have black sons and have relationship with both the white and black community, and so you can speak to this issue. How would you talk to the to the to the nation? And that going through this issue, not just the nation, but also the globe, because this is indeed a global platform. Um, how would you speak to that? Well, you know, I'd like to just back up for a moment, if I could, and and address black families, because because what I've been doing lately is a whole lot of listening and learning. Even though I'm married to a black woman. You know, I don't assume that I know everything about being black because I'm not black. And, and I've had to really take time to listen and to learn more and more deeply about what the experience of a black man is, a black father is, so that I can, I can really be a better, um, a better advocate. But I know that black parents teach their children how to be safe. Um, but I also want to, to say this, you know, to teach them to be confident, to be confident in, their, in themselves and in their own abilities, teach their children that is so important. You know, in, in many black families that, um, that I've been exposed to, the mother plays a very dominant role. The father, you know, so many of our black men are incarcerated. You know, a disproportionately large number are incarcerated. And even to the point where I used to work in, um, with youth in, in uh, California, and these were the youth of parents who were incarcerated. And one of the things I is that is that in jail. And for them, it was not uh, unexpected. They were thinking that they would go, and go to jail too, that that was their normal life. Expectancy or experiences is to go to jail as well. And, and so, you know, to me, one of the most important messages for us to convey is, you know, conduct yourself with dignity, as a human being, you know, conduct yourself, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use the term as a as a Christian man, and the reason I want to use that term is that 
a Christian man, in my view, is a man after God's heart. And Jesus said, if you want to lead, if you want to be first, you do what? You become a servant. You become a servant. And so teaching our children how to conduct themselves with dignity, but also to be, and I'm not talking about slaves in the sense of, of classic slavery in the United States, but I'm talking about, you know, I can, I can hold on to myself with such dignity that I don't have to lord it over anyone else, which is what white people do to black people, okay? We got this attitude of superiority and we need to learn to serve. That's following the example of Jesus. But you know, Jesus was able to set healthy boundaries. He was able to, to walk away when he needed to walk away. He was able to put people who were in positions of leadership in his day, you know, the religious leaders of his day. He knew how to speak very directly and honestly to them. His truth. We need to teach our young people how to do that. How to do that. You know, with love, but with strength. Okay? And so to me, that, that, that is such an important thing for us to do. Whether our biological father is in the home or not. You know, we need to teach our young people how to conduct themselves. Dr. The King was a, was a great example of what you just demonstrated about um, strength and boundary. Dr. Martin Luther King. Yes, I would. Absolutely, I would. You know, he wasn't a perfect person. You know, we know from his life, you know, biography that he had his flaws as a father too. But, you know, the most important thing that I, I want to say is that you know, we as fathers, we should stop pretending that we're perfect when we're not. You know, as I, as I shared in, in, my, in my short presentation, you know, to be able to be honest with ourselves and honest with our children and to, to see our areas of weakness and to embrace them and to then grow, that's the greatest gift, we, one of the greatest gifts we can give our children. One of the greatest gifts we can give our children is being on a trajectory of growth from where we have been to where God wants to take us. How would you propose that we continue to go forward uh, as Christians? Family, are even when yeah. we're broken. Yeah. Well, um, I think modeling is very, very important in Christian families. In other words, it's, it's very important for us to, to model what the Christian life is by um, things such as morning and evening devotions, for example. You know, teaching our children during those times is more than just, well, you know, it's my obligation to, to spend a few minutes with them, you know, um, you know, praying and doing a perfunctory devotion, but making it meaningful, you know, making it times of teaching and times of growing, recognizing that our children are uh, individuals who need to be converted as well. Children are not born converted. You know, children need to be born again, just like we as adults need to be born again. And, and so the more I can pour love into the hearts of my children, the more they experience God from me. They don't just hear about God from my devotional times, from my prayer times, but they experience God from me. That's probably even more important than what I say is what I, what, what I model um, to them. And so to me, that is, that's a very, very important part of it. Um, when our children are hurt, who are they to go to for comfort? You know, certainly they should be able to come to me as daddy for comfort, you know, to mom for comfort. You know, God in the scriptures is called the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulations. But, you know, most, many people don't know that about God because they've not been, they've not experienced comfort from their families. You know, we have this thing, especially with our male children as, as daddies, you know, 
if you fall down and hurt yourself, you know, stop being a baby, stop crying, you know, get up, you know, and, and, and so we, we don't teach our children that it's okay for them to, to even have feelings and emotions, which is an essential part of the human experience. You know, Jesus wept, Jesus was angry. You know, he didn't sin, but he was, you know, he had, he had all the feelings of a normal human being. And, and we need to allow our children to have those feelings too. And, and so, to me, those are important parts of how I can equip or train my children to be a good human being. So, let me, let me just yeah. end there. In respect to, you just mentioned Jesus, and I, and I want to refer to Jesus' childhood in terms of dysfunctional family. Uh, I, yeah. I, it is my conviction that Jesus too was raised in a quote-unquote dysfunctional family. Uh, in a sense where, here's it, this is Jesus Christ who his mother Mary was a virgin. The scripture made it clear. But yeah. at the same time, he was his father, uh, Joseph, where, as we know, was not his biological father is the Holy Spirit that impregnated Mary. And so here is it now, even from the inception, he, Joseph had a problem that he was going to give up Jesus, give up Mary, the marriage, because he believed that Mary maybe slept with a different man until the Holy Spirit um, told him otherwise. But I want to talk about the dysfunctional family of even G that Jesus himself born into as the Redeemer and to, to redeem the world. And then I want to come up with a follow, I want to ask a follow up question to apply to the dysfunctional family of this world uh, in terms of the healing process. But first, um, could you elaborate on the dysfunctional family structure? In my sense, I'll correct me if I'm wrong in terms of the structure that Jesus was born into. Well, let's just take for a moment um, Jesus. Um, even uh, conception and the, the months after that. We know that as soon as Mary got pregnant, the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 tells us that she went and stayed with her cousin Elizabeth, right? And that she was there for, for six months until John the Baptist, you know, was born. And, and, and so, Picture yourself coming back now after you're, you're showing now, right? You're showing the baby because you've been carrying this baby in your womb for a while. And you come back and you and Joseph, you know, you're married, you get married, but your neighbors can count the months, right? Your neighbors can count the months and it's like, so, you go home and you say to your to your your neighbors, you know, um, the, the baby that Mary is carrying, you know, is not my child, but it's a child of the Holy Spirit. And if you're one of the neighbors, how are you going to respond? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Tell me another one, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and so Jesus, you know, in the minds of his neighbors, is an illegitimate child. And we know that later on in his life, you know, the, the religious leaders used that against him to try and, and diminish his ministry. We also know that, as, you know, as soon as he was born, or at least um, before the age of two, that he and, and Joseph and Mary had to take off for another country, had to flee to Egypt. So does Jesus know what it's like to be an immigrant child? Yes. Does Jesus know what it's like to be considered an illegitimate child? Yes. So he can identify with us in that way. You know, we, we know that his brothers were not always kind to him because, you know, they thought he was, you know, a goody two shoes. And, and so they kind of made fun of him. And we know later in his life, his family even thought he was crazy. You know, they, they tried to come and, you know, and, uh, you know, and do something to intervene, you know, in his life because he thought, you know, he was going off the deep end in his ministry. And so, you know, Jesus did not, you know, Nazareth itself, I mean, people said, can anything good come of Nazareth? 
So that whole idea of, of being raised, you know, in Nazareth in this bad town, you know, is something that that people, um, you know, it was difficult. He was a carpenter's son. He learned to trade, which was a good thing. But but you know, he was he was a child that had had to learn, you know, what it was like to to live in a difficult family environment. And so and so, I think it's important for us to recognize that Jesus' family was not easy. And on top of that, you know, the only time we really learn about Joseph or hear about Joseph is very early in Jesus' life, you know? But we're not told in the scriptures how old Jesus was when Joseph died. And, and, and so it could very well be that, you know, that Joseph had really loved Jesus, but then, you know, Jesus um, had to live a lot of his young years without a father as well. And so Jesus did not have an, uh, an easy child. Jesus could identify, or uh, we could, uh, who comes from broken family, could I, Jesus could identify with us because he also, in a sense, quote unquote, was from a broken family. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. You know, and I really think that God intended it that way. That Jesus be born into brokenness because, you know, the Bible says that he was tested in all points like we are, you know, and yet without sin. In other words, he didn't respond to any of that in, in a sinful way. But he was one of us. You know, he lived, he suffered, you know, like we did so that we could identify with him. Not that he was just this perfect God up in the sky somewhere, but he was real human flesh, just like us. In my observation, I sometimes notice that in public, we are not hesitant to show our emotion in terms of handing out a reprimand to our children, etc. But we can get a little hesitant at times to show affection and nurturing in public. Do you have any comments or thoughts you can share on that for us, please? Well, what do you think, what do you think happens in the heart of a child when uh, publicly a, a father hugs his son or his daughter? That's I making a public statement of my love for you, of my care for you, you know? And, you know, we, you know, I think we've been raised culturally um, to, to not show affection or to not, um, I think we've been, let me call it sexual shame, you know, where, and I'm not talking about here sex in the sense of intercourse between husband and wife, but we carry this, this shame with us that, you know, and the shame basically says, what are people going to think of me if I do this? You know, we're, we're so afraid of what people think. And, and, and so the real, the real important thing is not what people think. It's, am I, am I seeing my child and meeting my child's needs, or am I sacrificing my child on the altar of what other people might think. You hear what I'm saying? Sacrificing my child on the altar of what other people might think. Yeah. And, and so each of our children are unique. They all have different needs because they're very different individuals. And so if you have a sensitive child, for example, you know, comforting that child in public may be something that's very important to that child. They may need that. And, and I don't care what people think. I don't care, you know, what you think. At least I've come to the point now in my journey of healing where it's so much less important for me to care about what other people might think. Rather, I'm going to know my child, love my child, pour into my child, based upon what they need because that's my responsibility as that child's parent as that child's father thank you 
You're welcome. Is there another question? Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. All right. My name is Michael Watts. I'm joining with you today as a brother in Christ. Now, I just want to add to what Pastor said because, especially where I live, you know, for the males to show affection to. Question: Where, 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 where do you? Can you tell us where you live, please? In Jamaica. Okay. So, you, go ahead, please. Yes. Yeah, so, um, in the culture is that the father, it's hard for them to show affection, you know, to the child because to them, oh, you're not supposed to be, you know, touchy or lovey with a male child. You know, so it's hard for you to show affection. But as Pastor said, you know, it, that affects the child more than we know it because that child now goes up not knowing how to show the affection when they too get their children. And that's a, a real issue that we have in Jamaica right now. You know, so it's something that we have to pray about and pray for the fathers, especially in our country. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, um, I want to go back to my last question, and um, Dr. Selachet, in respect to when I talk about the dysfunctionality uh, of, of Jesus grew up as the perfect example for the Messiah. Now, because we could now identify that Jesus didn't grow in a perfect home, um, how can you relate this to uh, this society in respect to the overall plan of redemption from God to restore the brokenness of humanity and wounded family? Mm, that is a really, really important question. Um, one of the things I think that is really important is that we understand that a lot of people, well-intended people, don't know how uh, to parent their children well. They never learned it. And if you've never learned how to parent your children well, what, what default are you going to use? You're going to use the default of what you learned from your parents. And when the Bible talks about the iniquity of the parents being visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation, um, what it means is that we have to look at the power of the cross to break that cycle, that generational pattern, and, and look to what our Heavenly Father does even now um, to intervene in those cycles of brokenness to try to come and, and rescue us. So I think, for example, what you're doing tonight is so important um, because we need to educate our, our families about how to do healthy parenting. You know, assuming that they don't you know that they don't know, you know, and so how do you parent, you know, how do you discipline your children in ways that are going to be growthful and not diminishing or demeaning them or shaming them or, or, or wounding them? You know, how, how do we do that? You know, how do we teach our children about things like money management and finances and having social skills and how to conduct themselves, how to have healthy boundaries. You know, we have to teach our, and sometimes we need to start with parents because parents don't know that. And so we need to, and learning to be gracious, learning to be forgiving. I mean, when you look at God, it, is he not the most gracious being that ever could be? That, that we, we rebelled against our very creator, and yet he was gracious to us. And the Bible says he waits to be gracious to us, you know, because he knows that we're on a journey of healing. And, and you know, so he waits until we're at certain places where we can receive things from him. So he's a wise father. He's a gracious father. And he's a wise father. He's a patient father. And, and so, you know, when we, when we really take a look at God as our Heavenly Father, um, 
I know my heart just melts when I take time to just sit with God and, and to, to think about and let myself feel God for myself and, and let him speak to me and he can correct me. You know, David, did you need to use that tone of voice? Oh, I'm sorry, God, I did, didn't die. And then I can go and apologize to Beverly or whomever. You know, I want to be taught by God even now at my age. You know, there, I don't assume that I know everything. To mix family. I, I know you, you, you can identify with that because you also um, have a mixed family of your own. Um, for example, our previous president, President Obama, um, grew up in a mixed family. His father, yeah. as we all know, is an African black man and his mother is a American white woman. And we see the product that's come from him as one of our, in my estimation, one of the greatest presidents this country ever had. And so talk about diversity, diversity um, in mixed family and also the various um, family groups. Um, could you shed some light on that, please, in the context of God created us all as children of God, as children of God? Yeah. That, that's so important to understand is that no matter who we are, no matter what our ethnic background, we're all members of God's family, we're all members of the human race. And, and, and to, to, to understand that is really important. I know when Beverly and I first met, um, you know, my family had some concerns, you know, especially about our children, you know, like, and we have a son together, Michael, and, you know, you know, is he going to be okay? Is he going to be made fun of? You know, I mean, is he going to be safe? You know, they had these questions, and 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 so, you know, we had to reassure them that God brought us together very clearly, and that God would take care of of any children that we had, but. I had to, I had to learn black culture, you know, with Beverly, you know, I had to learn certain things that were not natural to me, you know, um, I had to, I had to learn about black families and, and the way they think is often different than the way white families think. It's like, oh, okay, okay, I have to open to that. I, I became assimilated into black church, black worship, which was very different from what I was accustomed to in terms of, of Caucasian styles. And it's like, oh, and I wanted to tell you today, I, I, I would absolutely prefer black worship. Yeah, but, you know, I, honestly, because it speaks to my heart rather than just kind of my head, you know, and I just, I just appreciate it so much. And, and one of the things about our, our Michael is we wanted him to come to appreciate black culture as well as white culture, because he has the inheritance of both. And we want him to, to value the richness of the diversity of both cultures that he was a part of and be equally as comfortable in both cultures, even though we understand that that mixed um, race children are more often welcomed into black culture than they are into white culture. They get assimilated more easily into black culture. And so, you know, Michael, in many ways, thinks of himself as black, but also white. But And, and so, but helping them to to learn about the history of black culture and and the challenges of black culture and and to know how to function as um, a black child from mixed child you know in you know successfully was very very important to me you know that i you know i had i felt a very strong responsibility and in order to be able to teach him those things i had to expose him to those things i had to expose me to those things I had to learn some things I didn't know and, and and so to me that was that was um, you know a very important part of the upbringing of of our son and and our grand our grand we have three grandsons 
of Beverly's. Beverly was a teenage mom, I remember her story. She had uh, our son, Eric, at age 14. And Eric married a Caucasian wife too, and had three sons uh, from her. And so I have three uh, biracial grandsons as well. And so this, this thing runs, you know, in the family for us. So I, I, I'll keep going back to the, to, to, the Christian, to the Christian tradition. Now, what does God require of us? And one of the reasons why I'm so grateful that you're with us um, this evening, Dr. Um, Sarachek, as you know, this country is always of tension with race, black and white. For example, uh, by my accent, you could know that, uh, you already know, but everyone will know that I'm, I was from Jamaica. And one of the beauty of race, of group in Jamaica, as you know, 90% plus of us are black and are black. And so when I, when I grew up, there's a few Caucasian, yes, but we, I, I was not introduced to racism until I come to this country. And so I, I know what it is to live uh, and don't have to worry about racism and being a Christian. Will you agree with me that there is no room for being a racist and being a Christian at the same time? Um, if I could say a thousand percent, yes, I would. Absolutely, there's no place. And, and unfortunately, um, I believe that the majority of, of Caucasian Christian folks today don't understand that. They don't, they don't see the racism that is simply part and parcel of, of who they are. You know, their Jesus is a white Jesus, you know, with white privilege and white expectations. And, and we just, most of us just don't see we, you know, we're, we're blind like the Pharisees were blind, you know, in the scriptures. Um, and, and, and so, you know, we might even have some black friends, you know, and having black friends, you know, doesn't mean that we understand what it's like to, to live the black experience. And, and so, absolutely mean we have to do more than just name the name of jesus you know for us as christians i mean being passionate about this issue of racism is part and parcel of our dna i mean when you look for example at at, at jesus life you know his mission statement was to, to heal the brokenhearted you know to set at liberty them that are bruised, you know, those who are oppressed, you know, to see them and, and to intervene, you know, in, in oppression. When you look even back to the book of Exodus, you know, um, when, when uh, they talk about the Sabbath commandment back in the book of Exodus, now, excuse me, in Deuteronomy chapter five, you know, it says, keep the Sabbath, you and your, you sons and daughters and your manservant and maidservant, etc." And it says, so that you'll remember that you were once slaves in Egypt. You know, that's the purpose of keeping the Sabbath, is to remember our own oppression. And so even our, even our keeping a day holy for God, the Sabbath day holy, is, to re, is a social justice statement. To remember our history, not to forget. And we've all been enslaved to sin. And we've all been in bondage to sin. So whether we're Caucasians or not, we're all, we all have experienced that if we're willing to acknowledge it. But my, final, my final question, um, Dr. Solacek. Um, as a father who, in a, a mixed um, family, um, what, what would your message um, be to um, white fathers that are white fathers and also even though um, you, you admit that you're not a black man so you cannot speak fully to all the black issue but what would you what would be your unified message in Christ um, to all fathers as a Christian because being a Christian I think that qualify you to speak on behalf 
of Jesus in terms of what Jesus expects from us as Father. May we be black or may we be white because Christianity, as we already established, transcends all and race and culture. So what would be your Father's Day message to white um, fathers and to black fathers? And I also, if you could just summarize it in terms of the fact that we all are one, Dr. Thurber was with us on Thursday, and he's also a therapist and a psychiatrist, and he, 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 one of his thoughts is we all are damaged good, goods. And so in terms of we all are damaged goods because of sin, what is your unified message to black fathers, white fathers, brown fathers, all fathers? What's your unified message in Christ to us? Do you, do you hear my question clearly? I did. Thank okay. you. Okay. I sure did. Thank you, Pastor Brian. Um, one of the things that I regret is that when I was uh, a child coming up, um, I was not exposed to any minority of any kind until I went to high school. I went away from home. And, and we were taught um, language about other cultures that was demeaning, okay? And so, if, you know, if I had a message to, to give to white fathers, it would be, it would be um, take time to expose your children to many other cultures while they're children. Teach them, teach them the message and demonstrate the message that whites are not superior to any other race. We're not, but teach our children that. You know, be very explicit about that. And so help them, you know, you know, often, you know, on, you know, there are pros and cons to this, but even as Christian parents, we do service projects where we might go into, you know, into um, other neighborhoods and help them out. But in, in helping them out, are we sending a message that we're here and they're here and we're coming to help those people who can't help themselves? You know, we don't want to even in our serving them to, to convey that message. We want to convey a message of dignity and equality for, for, for everyone. And, and so I would want, I would want to, ex, to, be, to expose my children to all cultures and to convey a message of, of the dignity of every single human being and, and to model that uh, on behalf of my children so that they would really internalize that from dad, because I, I consider myself the one who's most responsible for teaching that to my children. Um, if I had a message for, for black fathers, it would be um, teach your children to hold their heads up high. Teach them, teach them to, to be able to have a voice, a, a strong, powerful voice um, and, and to not give in to cultural stereotypes about you, you know, as a black father, you know, in other words, be present, be there, learn to love, whatever, whatever deficits that you had, you know, learn from them and then grow through that. And understand that we as white people have, have very similar deficits too, you know, and, and it's okay that we can connect. And, and so to whatever degree you can, while you're carrying yourself with dignity, you know, help your children to be exposed also to other cultures and convey the message of, of equality as well. Uh, and, and no matter how they respond, remember, you have learned to hold on to yourself with dignity so that no matter what anyone else thinks about you or says, that doesn't define you. Your being a, a child of God defines you regardless of who you are.
Indeed, I appreciate it. I'm hearing from Pastor Library. I want to ask you, our conference, our general conference, does not have a stand on civil unrest and have left it up to the member, individual members to do it. What is your stance on that? Thank you for asking that question. Um, I agree with that. Um, we, you know, we need to teach the dignity of, of all people, the sonship and daughtership of all people, regardless of gender, race, any other uh, uh, description that you can that you can that you can have. And if I were to be an advocate, I would strongly suggest that we need to think about that because we are a global church and we need to convey a strong message as a global church of equality and dignity for all regardless of race um, or gender we need to we need to, to to advocate for that i you know as a seminary professor i'm very open about advocating for that and and I try to use my voice and my pen to write uh, as an advocate for that. Because to me, that is what Jesus did. That's what God still does today. And, and I believe that we in the church fall short when we fall short of that biblical ideal. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate You're it. Well. Uh, indeed. And indeed, I, I appreciate it, uh, Dr. Slachek. You know, I... I believe the concern is not necessarily a question here, but one of the concerns that I have as a father and as a black man, confident black man, who believe that all of us are created in the image of God, oftentimes when I drive down the street, police oftentimes profile me different from how they will profile a white man. And one, one of the concerns that we have as father is when we send out our children, our son, particularly our young black son, they get murdered. Um, and I, you know, if they lay down, then they, 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 they put their, their feet on our neck and, and, and pretty much kill us. And if we run, they shoot us in the back. And so it is one of those issues that I know it is, that those are issues that I have to deal with as a black man. This is the issue that I have to deal with raising sons. And, and so those are some of my concerns. And, and, and these are real issues. And what we promote on, the, on this show is that we must, while we must do, go about it like Dr. King and Gandhi and Jesus in a nonviolent way. But at the same time, we believe in pushback with all our might to make it to the legislative branch of government, to the judicial branch of government, or to the executive branch of government you know we have a president and a vice president who has really a deaf ear um, to these issues, appear to be. But I'm so glad that you chose to be here with us this evening, Dr. Slarchak. I know you're a man of integrity. I know you're a man who don't see race and gender. You are a man of God, and that's the reason why it is such a honor and a privilege to have you and this show this evening and so we just want to thank you for taking the time out of your business schedule to be here with us this evening thank you thank you and um i would want to stand right with you pastor and mrs barnaby as you are suffering and you know with you know with that kind of uh, bias against you i would be standing marching side by side with you if i were there I know that. And I just want to let you know that it is because I know that who you are while I ask you to be here on this high day, Father's Day, because I know who you are. Thank you. Dr. Payne, could you share us the current start in respect to this COVID-19, please? <laughs> okay. The, uh, the global at this time is um, 8 million 546,919. That went up by 27,376 yesterday. The deaths, 
is at 456,728, and that went up by 2,144 yesterday. In the United States, the number is now at 2,310,550, and that went up by 26,064 yesterday. And the debts in, new, in the United States is at 121,599. That went up by 353 yesterday. New York, the figure is at um, 387,936. And that went up by 664 yesterday. And the debts is still at 24,000. 710, it didn't go up yesterday. In Georgia, the number now is at 64,693. That went up by 895 yesterday. And the debt is at 2,643. And we had one debt yesterday. The global standing right now is still the United States then Brazil, then Russia, then India, then, um, then the United Kingdom. So those numbers haven't changed. But, um, and in the United States, we have um, 1,470,000 686 people still in the hospital. In Brazil, we have 480,008 people still in the hospital. In Russia, the number is 236,858. In India, the number is 175,727. And in the United Kingdom, the number is at 261,699. Now, this, the top 10, 10 states is New York, California, New Jersey, Illinois. Texas has moved into fourth place. Um, Massachusetts, Florida, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Georgia has moved up into 10th um, place. Um, the, the, not, the, the states that opened up early was Texas, Florida, and Georgia. The other 21, the other um, 18 states have not gotten into the top 10 yet, but they're fast approaching. Prematurely and refuse to listen to our medical profession, both of our scientists and our doctor. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. And as I said before, the countries that listen to the doctors, some of them have gotten over the virus completely. Wow. But we, we, we were stubborn and we wanted to do our own thing and whatever. Okay, so it's, it is clear evidence that we need to continue to listen to our scientists. Uh, in fact, a physician was on our show last night and she made sure that this virus is still deadly. So for, to our audience, uh, I just want to remind us all that this, this virus is, is a killer. And it is no joke, and we must continue to be prudent for our own sake and for our family. That start prove that to be so. Is that correct? That is correct. And yeah. if we don't take it serious, we're gonna have it through the rest of the year. Indeed, I appreciate that, Doctor Payne. Thank you. At this time, I'm gonna call upon Pastor Liber now to give us a five-minute devotional thought. Pastor Liber, please. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I am glad today that God is my father. Aren't you happy that you have a father who knows everything there is to know about you? Aren't you glad you have a father that even though you've turned your back on, on him at times, he's still there with you? You know, sometimes relatives and so-called friends will turn their backs on you. Sometimes 
your earthly father, when you are born illegitimately, uh, will never hear from them. They don't give you a dime. And when you graduate, they don't attend your graduation. But I have got a father, and his name is Jesus. And when I graduate, he was right there. I've got a father. He's my eternal father, and he lives. And no matter what I do, he never turns his back on me. Others may turn their backs on me, but my father is in my corner. I've got a father. Do you have a father? Do you know my father? He's everybody's father. And that makes us kinfolks. Aren't you glad that everybody's related? If you are the father's child, it doesn't matter where you are. If God's your father, we are brothers and sisters. Um, so don't get mad at me or anyone else. We all are part of the Father's family. We may not always agree, but let us work together and let bygones be bygones. My friends, I've got a heavenly Father you can pray to. So when you pray, do like Dr. Bolton just now say, Our Father, who art in heaven, some people don't understand that you have a father. Oh, yes, you do. It doesn't matter that you haven't seen your father. You have a heavenly father. You haven't laid eyes on him. But if you know him by faith, you see him anyhow. And when you go through your difficult times, don't hold your head down, but lift them up to the hills. From whence come your help? For your help comes from your father who made the hills. I've got a father who loves me. And, and this, this is something that should hit all of us. When we think of the prodigal son who left home and the neighbors and even his own brother had given up on him. That sounds like something we are accustomed to hearing. However, when, when he decided to come home, the father was right there waiting for him. He came home. He never gave up hope that he would return. Our father God would never give up hope on us. And that's a blessing. Aren't you glad God never gave up on you? That in, in, that in itself is a testimony for if we are honest, we would admit that we haven't been all we should, but we are thankful for our Heavenly Father who looks beyond our faults and sees our needs. So when you pray, even while walking or driving down the street, when no one knows you are praying, but you and your Heavenly Father, when your lips aren't moving, but your mind is, Say, our Father, and qualify it so everybody would know who you are talking about. Say, our Father, who art in heaven, and when you lift up the name of to heaven, God will send blessings down on that name. Our Father, who art in heaven, Lord, thank you for being our heavenly Father. There is none like you. And today we sit and stand and acknowledge as our Heavenly Father. We haven't been all we should, we could be, but we thank you for your mercy and grace that has kept us in the land of the living. You have looked beyond all our faults and seen our needs. Thank you, Father. Amen. And so at this time, we're going to transition into our final segment of this program. Uh, Miss Morning, you would uh, present your song. Thank you. And after Sister Martley, we will go into a season of prayer. We'll ask Pastor Bulgin, Pastor Lyburn, and then also da um, our special guest, Dr. Slachek, to give us closing prayer. Sister Martley, please. 
Pastor Lyburn, Pastor Paul Jane, and then Dr. Slochak. Oh, Father, oh, Father, and oh, God, thank you this evening for the opportunity we had to sit at the feet of Dr. Slochak as he opened to us, shared with us the situations um, afflicting our lives for direction in the affairs of our daily lives. Thank you very much. Pray for your continued blessings upon him. And pray for the program here, Dr. The Final Shout Ministry, that you continue to fill Dr. Barnaby and family with your spirit so that we can continue to have this broadcast day after day. We pray for souls, dear Lord. We pray for those who come onto this program somehow that your word, your direction for their, each and every one of our lives will be so fitting that we will realize the times in which we are living and prepare our hearts to meet you in peace. We pray for the civil unrest that's going on even now. And we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are grieving as a result of losing a loved one. And Lord, time is running out. We know that we can see it. It is your signs of your coming are being printed everywhere. Help us to prepare ourselves to get our hearts right with you because tomorrow is not promised. Thank you for 
the music, the, especially Sister Marva, as she came on today with the appropriate tunes for our service here this afternoon. Thank you. May your continued blessing be upon each and every one. And may we reach out and let others know about this program. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. And Father, we continue to praise you. We recognize that had it not been for you on our side, where would we be? We're living in a world of turmoil, and only you, God, can step in and settle that. And so we claim your promises that you will never leave us or forsake us. We thank you for the time that Dr. Sedat Sek was able to spend with us this evening. We're thankful for the thoughts that he brought forth. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit who continues to work in all of our lives to perfect your character in us and to prepare us for your return. We surrender our wills to you. We're very thankful for Pastor Barnaby and for his family and for all of those who took part in this program this evening, those who have tuned in online, the songs and the testimonies that are given. We are very mindful of those who have suffered loss through this pandemic that has been going around. And God, we declare healing over the land, indeed not over only in these United States, but around the world, that your healing hand would be upon all the nations, that the plague would be stopped, and that our prayers like incense would come up before your throne. Father, we know that soon and very soon you will come. We look forward to that. The whole world groans in birth pains as we await that day. And so we ask that you would hasten the day of your return when all of your people from all over the globe will come and will stand before you. We will cast our crowns at your feet and we'll praise you forevermore because you're worthy. And as John declares, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and honor and glory and majesty and power. And so God, we will give you all that praise because you are worthy of our praise. Hasten then the day when we shall see you at last and shall stand before you and give you glory throughout endless ages because of what you have done on Calvary for saving us in Christ Jesus, amen. Yeah. Amen. Father, all those who are listening, the families who have um, taken time to join our this, this uh, conversation tonight, Lord, you know each and every one of them. You know, Lord, their, their strengths, their love for you, Lord, their longing to know more about you. But you also know their brokenness, God. You know their suffering as well. And so, God, I pray that your spirit would visit each home in the way that only you can do tonight, Father. And, Father, to bring um, a specific um, experience to each home according to each individual need. Lord, whether it's encouragement to those who need encouragement, financial support to those who need financial support. Conviction, Lord, to those who need conviction. And Father, healing to those who need healing. Lord, I read in your word that when you were in the Garden of Gethsemane, you said, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Lord, that tells me that no matter what suffering is going on in the lives of the people on this call tonight, Father, you felt it all. 
you were crushed, Lord, with their grief as well. Mm-hmm. Lord, that your word says, um, in all their suffering, in all of our suffering, Lord, you also suffered. And so, God, you feel all of our pain corporately as a whole human race. You take it upon yourself. And so, Lord, I know because of that that you can bring healing to every home as well. And so, God, I just thank you for being this large, wonderful God. And, Lord, I pray that each one of us would experience you. Lord, I see you holding your hands out as you did to the blind man. What do you want me to do for you? Asking that question. Give us the courage, Lord, to tell you what it is that we need for you to do for each one of us, each one of our families, each father who's on this call tonight. And I thank you, Lord, that you're going to answer. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Dr. Slachek, um, and for all those who have participated, and for you, the audience, that have spent this valid moment with us. We just want to let you know that we appreciate it, and clearly, the God who we serve loves us. I just want to let you know that Dr. Um, Slachek and his wife, um, Ms. Beverly, have been a co-author of a book, Cleansing the Sanctuary of the Heart cleansing the sanctuary of the heart and so if you want to um, get a copy of this book um, you could just contact us and we will put you in contact with Dr. Um, Solacek and his wife. Again Dr. Solacek on behalf of all of us here at FSM Daily Digital Show we want to thank you and not just you but your wife because we know that ministry involved not just you but your wife as well and that working behind the scene to make this possible. So on behalf of all of us, we just want to thank you very much for spending this Father's Day with us. Thank you. You're so welcome. I'm so glad to be here with you. God bless. Yes. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you for being here.